Hello, my name is Rocio Galarza, and I am the AVP of U.S. Social Impact here at Sesame Workshop. I've had the, the pleasure of working here for around 15 years and learning so much from all of you, uh, family child care providers throughout the years, the work that you do and the incredible contributions that you have in your community. Particularly, and we're going to uh, touch upon this in the in the learning environments uh, webinar, but particularly of the wonderful work and the trusted, the trust that you have um, of the parents and the kids that, that you serve every day. So today we're going to be talking about learning environments. And we're talking about learning environments because throughout our the years when we are doing um, particularly the, the social impact initiatives, we've learned a lot about what makes learning environments something that, how to maximize learning environments to something that children can really benefit from. And as part of Sesame Street in communities, we were able to really come together in, in all of these learnings throughout the years and see what are some of the, of the uh, components that can make learning environments most, most helpful. And so that's what, that's what we're going to be talking about today in this webinar. We're going to define learning environments. We're going to, then afterwards, we're going to think creatively about our space and interactions. And part of this is because what we've learned is that um, sometimes we feel so comfortable in our own environments and we, we make kids feel so comfortable in our own environments that sometimes we, it's hard for us to think about them in a different way to maximize that learning. And so today what we're going to be doing is doing a, a series of exercises that can help us think differently. And um, this is not necessarily better or worse, it's just different, right? So that we can see what are some new opportunities that perhaps we haven't thought about before that we can do with our, with our spaces. And then we're going to learn more specifically about the standards for an EFCC. And we, are, we have this incredible resource in Barbara Ann who's going to go through very specifically how to make, and practically how to make a learning environment um, be the most that it can be. So let's start with, with a simple definition. So what are learning environments? Learning environments, when we talk about them, it includes the idea of the physical location, it includes the context in which le uh, kids are learning and are exploring the world. And also the culture, the culture that we develop in our programs that, that not only include the kids that we're serving, but also the greater community. And so in order for us to maximize that learning environment, we do have to look at all of these things, not only the physical structures that can um, help us create a, a better um, routines for learning, but also the bigger culture that we're that we're developing, how we're communicating with parents and so much more. In looking at the, the, the definition and later on exploring what learning environments are, we found this interesting model from the Iris Center in Vanderbilt University. The, they divided learning environments, particularly early childhood learning environments, into three components. The first one being a social component. These are the members of my community and the interactions that I have with them. Of course, includes children, includes other, perhaps other providers, but definitely parents and the community at large. There's also the temporal components. And these are the routines and your schedules, the things that require time, right, that are related to time and the activities that are, that, and the timing of these activities and how they, um, they help or hinder the learning. And then we have physical environments, which of course are the space. And Barbara Ann has such incredible ideas um, related to the physical components. So she later on will talk a lot more about this. When we look into the social components uh, of a learning environment, and by the way, this is this is what we have learned, but, but there are many, many different ways of dividing this, these components. In our experience, there are three basic um, um, sub components, I should say, on social on, on social interactions. There's the adult child interactions that include the adult and the child. From an adult perspective, it's facilitated learning. So the adult is really is not imposing learning, but it's really trying to facilitate and guide that learning with the, ch the child. We often use the word nurturing environments, which of course all of you do have, you care so much about the children that you serve, they feel welcomed and they feel comfortable and cared for. 
and there's a lot of trust and in family child care providers um, as I, uh, programs as I mentioned before there is a lot of trust that families have in you and, and in the in the services that you provide and then from a child's perspective we're talking about what is age appropriate? What are the expectations that I should have for my infants versus the preschoolers versus the school age children that come in later on? Also making ch children feel valued and in making them feel valued, valued is, is giving them choices and making sure that they feel like their choices are um, irrelevant into the, in, in their interactions that they have with you and in the activities that you're providing. And also capable. And when we mention capable, Come, the first thing that comes to mind is how are the kids participating in the activities that you have? And it's very, very easy, particularly for some of the, of the learning goals that are more complicated, let's say science and math, um, it's very, very easy for us to be exposing children to a lot of concepts and not necessarily engaging them in making stuff and in, um, in participating in the activities. And it, ha it happens a lot. I mean, it happens to all all teachers and all early childhood educators. And so in order for children to feel capable, we have to think about what is it that we are um, providing to them that is helping them um, uh, create and make and be part of that activity. And of course, the in terms of adult child interactions is also the connection with the greater community, which is an, a crucial part of the culture that you're creating. And, and as we saw earlier, the definition of early um, of learning environments. And then we have the learning goals. And you see here in this learning goals, we're using a framework, we're using the Sesame framework, but it's based on the Head Start framework, which I'm sure you, you all have seen. Um, and we talk about the whole child. And when we think about the whole child, we're really thinking about the social, the language, cognition, physical, and of course, how children learn is a big part of, of creating a whole child curriculum. Because one of the most important things that you can give a child is not only these concepts on how to develop friendships, how to interact with others, but you're, what you're really teaching them is how to learn. And that can apply to so many different um, subjects and concepts later on. It's the process of learning. And then, of course, we're talking about activities that are either individual or in groups and so you know some of the learning goals or some of um, the things that that are the objectives in your in your program might be more um, it's more helpful to have individual one-to-one um, -one type of activities and by activities can be even in conversation with a parent that's an individual type of, of activity in our in this kind of world of envisioning the social components um, but it can have group activities and so how are these social components kind of interacting with one another is something that we will see later on. All right, so let's go to the temporal components. Of course, we have routines, and we've included night routines here as much as, as morning and noon uh, routines, just because when it comes to learning environments, what happens at night, whether you have the kids in your program or not, affect your program. So we have to, you know, it, it's, it's um, um, in, in order for you to create a learning environment, you have to understand what that night, what the night routines are. And, and perhaps that, that entails some activities where, where parents are letting you know how, how children um, are, are doing at nighttime. Are they getting enough sleep? You know? so, so those are things to consider. So that's why we included them here. And of course, you have uh, routines throughout your day that you've scheduled and that men, and many children expect them um, throughout throughout your program. All right. In addition to that, we have activities. And I, I, again, activities can be divided into social and temporal. When it comes to temporal here, we, we talk about the schedule and the timing of the activities, how long the activities are. Um, when you have a group of, of children that are five or older, you can have longer activities. When you have babies, you know, the attention span um, is very different. And so that is an important consideration um, when you're basically combining all of these groups all together. So uh, ca the calendar of activities, when you think about your learning environments and having a calendar of when you, when you can really take the kids and when there's some days that, you know, they're holidays or they're, 
you need a break, you need professional development. So all of that also affects your learning environment because it affects how the family and your community interacts with your program. So that's, those are, are some ideas or, or um, I should say um, examples of how a calendar can become an important part of that learning um, environment. All right, so we've gone through quite a bit. Um, and there are, there's more, but I'm going to let Barbara and Ann talk a little bit more about space later on. What I want us to think about now with all of these different things that we've, that we've discovered together is how do I use this to then make a map of what my early childhood environment is like? So my learning environment being in the middle, let's see how we can use these components. The components that we, were, that we have been discussing, interactions, learning goals, routine, activities, and later on space, are part of this map. And you can add, and you can, of course, divide this learning environment in different ways. We provided these because in our search for what is a learning environment for early childhood, actually these have come up uh, quite frequently. But, but this, is, this is your beginning um, stage in terms of, let's call them variables of what the learning environment needs to consider. And then all of these different things that we, the specifics that we talked about, which of course, once you get into the more specific, you can break it down even in many different ways, in such different ways. Um, then you put those specifics right there. So you have your visual map of all of them, of all of this, these concepts that make up what your program is in terms of a learning environment. And we're, you can even break it down even further. We just, we didn't discuss it in, um, uh, before, but look, you can break it down so that your learning goals per, you know, the, per the area could be even broken down more. And you can do it so on and so forth, right? It can get a little hairy at that point because <laughs> there's going to be a lot of boxes. So, so that's why we kept it to the level that we kept it. But you could, you could make um, the map even more complex. And then you, once you have your map, that is your map of your learning environment, you can do several exercises where you then, then you can explore even further. The first exercise, um, I'm calling it comparing variables. Um, it's, the name is not very sexy, <laughs> um, but, but, it is, but it is what it is, you know, that you're basically taking two variables and taking into consideration those variables, you're thinking about the activities or the or the things that you already have in your program where those two variables are coming together. So let's take this example um, of the activities, the individual and the learning goals. So after the activities that I have after my program are, is, is done, basically let's say I'm, I'm sending a newsletter or an email or a text to the parents so that they know what their child did today. How are they tying up to my learning goals? How am I making sure that the parent understands that that image that I'm sending is not only because it's cute, it's because it's meeting a curriculum or, a, or something that I wanted to teach that child? And what, or, what of those learning goals is best highlighted, right? Is it a cognitive, is it a physical, social, emotional, so on and so forth? What is highlighted in that particular communication? So another example, individual, we, we talked about that a little bit in terms of, of um, uh, what are some of the activities that I have that give the child more of a choice as an individual that are still tying into a literacy experience, let's say. Am I giving them, are, are they choosing the books that they want to read? Is one child really the one that is choosing for the group the book that they want to read? That will be part of that individual activity that is tied with the learning goal. Um, group activities, which we have uh, quite a bit of, usually in our program, scheduled in our program, are again, very good for, for social. Um, a lot of pretend play can be used to expand all sorts of learning goals and to help you facilitate in very specific ways. And the length of the activities, you know, some, some activities might need some more time in order for you you to um, to really do meet your goals, right? So, for for example, physical activity. Um, how much time are you giving for vigorous movement 
in your program versus how much time are you giving for re uh, rest and relaxation time. Um, those are those are important concepts or ideas to, to kind of put together. Um, and all of this, basically, you go through these variables and you make you make lists of what you already are offering in your program and how they are meeting all of these goals, just so that you have a sense of what your what your learning environment is already providing. So if we go to exercise number two, now we note opportunities. And in this one, what we do is we take our map and we start asking some questions related to how actually and how these different variables can relate to one another so that we can see opportunities that we didn't have before in our programs that we can incorporate. So let's go to question number one here. So it's an example. How can snack time help me teach self-regulation skills? So snack time being a routine and self-regulation skills, of course, being part of the learning goals that we have in cognition. So that, that question basically is looking for the relationship between two, the two. And then finding, and then you can really brainstorm on, well, you know, this, these are some ideas that I can use next, next, that time for self-regulation. Can actually have them wait a little bit for, to get more fruit at the end, if they, you know, if, if they are able to, you know, like the, the marshmallow test. Um, if they're able to wait X amount of time, they're, they're getting an extra piece of fruit or something like that. Um, also, for the second question, how can kids of different ages practice storytelling together? So we're taking the idea of an activity, a group activity, and then we're looking into interactions for children. And in this particular case, we're also lo we're looking at what is age appropriate, right? So those are the those are two important things that we're that we're targeting here. You can even set, you can even incorporate the learning goal for language and literacy in this particular question. The third question is, can I organize my space to help children feel capable? Um, again, this is space and interaction coming together so that, so that when I'm actually looking at my space, what are the opportunities that I'm giving kids to not only make choices, but to create, to make. Um, and that gives you quite a bit of, of, it's very telling, right, when you look at your space in that way. Um, then you look at the materials and you look at, at many other components within that space variable and, and it's able, you are able to manipulate it. Um, the fourth one is how can I help parents feel included at drop-off and pick-up times? And this is the com connection with community and, and, um, and routines. The idea that it's not only what I do in my program, but it's also those transitions between my program and home. Okay. So that's exercise number two. You've noticed, uh, you've made all these questions, you've noticed opportunities, um, and then we can try exercise number three, which this one has a better name. <laughs> we, we're calling it kid inspection. But with all of these ideas, you're actually walking around your environment and with your map in at hand, and you're really looking for, for ways of help, helping children be more curious, um, and how you tie in that curiosity with the variables in the actual environment. Um, you can note opportunities for learning. We do this very well, actually. Um, we go very specific on, on these exercises for our math course, which is available now, um, Make Believe with Math, if you want to register, it's for free. Well, but in the Make Believe with Math, what we help um, uh, educators to do is to walk around their space and look for the math opportunities, particularly the math talk that they can be using with kids in different areas of their program, um, in different parts of the house, in different, whatever your environment is, how can you maximize it for math talk? You can do that the same way with all the other learning, or learning areas. And of course, you can keep safety in mind. Um, when you are really doing that kid inspection, for safety, sometimes it's actually very helpful just to sit, well, in any case, this will be helpful to sit down to kids' level and see what it is that children are seeing. And then you, you will notice, you know, some of the, the, the choices that you're making um, in, in terms of your space can be affecting whether children feel 
um, uh, that they can make choices, whether uh, children feel like they can participate in certain things, um, and what they are more curious about. So, so kid inspection is the third one, again, with your map in hand, so that you don't forget what the variables are. All right, we have uh, an example for you in Sesame Street in communities called Walk and Talk, which is the same uh, idea of an of a inspection, but in this particular case is walking around the room so that you are coming up with ways, uh, it's for language development, so it's coming up with ways of describing any type of room to a baby, to young kids, so that you're really maximizing the vocabulary that you're exposing them to. So you walk through the, through the room, and you start describing things, and what is it that kids are going to find interesting? Um, how do I explain it so that maybe I add something funny in it so that they keep paying attention, but I also understand that the room itself, even as a very um, uh, simple room, can actually generate all sorts of vocabulary learning for that child. All right, so we've talked, I've talked a lot. So it's time for Barbara Ann <laughs> to join me in this conversation. Barbara Ann, if you can please, um, uh, with all your experience about physical components and, and, this, and space, if you can share some of your, of your knowledge with us. Ah, I'm unmuted. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Hi, it's Barbara Ann. And I've enjoyed the first part of this program and we'll try to tie it directly with some of the things that I'm going to show you in this part. First of all, I want to say that as the full screen of my slides hopefully shows up, um, that one of the things that I believe is that the environment is the third teacher. You have the provider, you have the program, and you have the environment. And all of those work together to create what we hope is a high quality childcare program. At NAFCC accreditation, we always stress the fact that there are many ways to develop a high quality childcare environment in the multi-age group setting that is a family childcare home. What I will do is to show you some photographs from some family childcare programs right here in our area, and we will consider how these environments support both the adult child interactions, the learning goals and activities, and offer also offer space for interactions between the age groups, because that's critical. And it's matched with the need for space to individualize activities for each age group. So you have to be able to have them be able to interact, but also give them their own space, spaces for the babies to be able to crawl and lay on the floor without being walked on, and spaces for the school age kids to be able to work on delicate projects and not have them affected by the younger kids. So we'll be looking at some designs that get into that. And the last flexibility the family child care providers really need in the environment in terms of structure is the ability to change that environment as their population changes, either as the children that they're caring for grow older, or as new ch children enter the environment and they haven't had children of that age before, they have to figure out how to merge those into the environment as well. And that's very different in family child care and very creative for all of you. So I hope that um, when we do the walk through the pictures that we can, that I can talk about that and hopefully we'll get a chance for you to uh, give some responses and thoughts. So if we could start with my first slide. Second slide. <laughs> Hi. Okay. This one is about safety. And if you look at this slide, what I was focusing on when I saw this picture is that this is the diapering table. And you'll notice that it's in the corner of a room. We can't see the rest of the room, but we can see that there's a room next to it and currently a hallway behind it. What I'm concerned about in this picture is that when you are diapering an infant, if you are a one person family child care home, you really have to be able to see all of the other children while you're diapering that child. And in this situation, there's a lot of blocks. There are places where you wouldn't be able to see the other children. If, however, it was a group family child care home where there are multiple providers, then perhaps the children could be in that room to the right where you see the easel. 
and a provider would still be able to utilize this uh, brain table. But that is my only concern with that particular site. It's probably the only slide where I'm going to have concerns, but I thought I would share one uh, just to give you the thoughts of looking at what it is you have to do to be able to manage this group of children. Next slide, please. And this one has to do with comfort. You need to have spaces that are comfortable for all ages of children. And this, I thought, was a delightful one, except perhaps for that door, which I hope is very well locked on the left-hand side so that no one's walking in onto this area. But they've got soft space. They've got books. They've got um, colorful things on the walls. And you can see on the left, there's a case where the children can actually reach materials as well as being able to reach the books. And it's also just a little bit um, secluded from the rest of the room. So little people back there can feel like they're really in a space that there is theirs alone. And um, I'm particularly happy with that particular setting. Next one, please. This is a totally different one. Again, the books are in the right kind of a level. In this case, they were able to have little kid couches, which are pretty interesting. And there's also the rocking chair in the back so that a provider might be holding a baby on the rocking chair while the children are at the book area, um, or actually perhaps using that as an area to sit and read to the children by moving the little couches around. The floor looks well carpeted and an extra soft space in front of the book area. And I like the fact that there is um, direct lighting from the outside, very important. The lighting is something that's really important in childcare rooms. And in this case, it looks as though it's uh, perfect outdoor daylight lighting. Next slide. Now we're looking at multi-sensory spaces, things that have lots of stuff in them. And in this case, while I really love the stuff, the changes of outfits, the little cooking area, all kinds of really neat stuff for kids to be able to choose from, and it's at the right height. It is quite tight. Um, and there's a box on the floor that I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to be for. I think that just a bit more space in this area might have been useful um, because if you get more than one child in there, it's going to be truly busy. Next slide. Now, on the other hand, here's a multi-sensory space that is really well-defined. You've got play area in the center, you've got storage area for supplies on the sides. And while there's not a lot of hands-on stuff in this one, the space is nicely divided and easy to access. And it looks like most things are at child level and again, We've got natural light coming in from those windows, and that for me is one of the big, big, big best parts of a um, quality child care environment. Next, please. Oh, there are those materials again. I duplicated a slide, sorry about that. Next, please. And again, ah, here we go. Now we've got an indoor environment. We're going into indoor environments and again, looking for spaces that have things in order and are accessible to children. And this is really a beautiful setup. Um, all of the materials are clearly sorted. I know it's going to take a lot of time to put those things back, but in many cases, when they're arranged in this way, it's easy to work with the children to be able to put things back into the spaces that were defined for those things. Sometimes we can label them with signs at the top. So with picture signs that shows that the circle things go in this bin and the rectangular things go in this bin, and you can also do it with colors. But this is a very, very well organized area. And with the height of those cabinets, looking at if you take a look at where the doorknob is located, um, that's probably a good. Mm, just a little higher than toddler and a little bit of a pre-K level, but the same kind of an environment can be created 
uh, depending on the age levels that you're working with and provides both for some programmatic opportunities and some learning opportunities and interactions in, ter in terms of children helping children to sort and put things back in space. So I'm also very um, happy with that particular environment. Next slide. Okay, here's one that shows you the interaction between what looks like the family kitchen, because there's a large table, and the area in which there are children's activities. And that's something that's very important when you're looking at family child care homes, because obviously you still have to live there, and your family has to be able to feel comfortable in their own home while still having sections of it converted into areas for child care activities. And this is another display of things that are available at child level, which is, which is critical in a family child care home, that children be able to select things, play with them, use them for their development, or where you can select things to use as part of your program. But both of those opportunities are available to children throughout the day. And this one has some very low shelves. Um, again, a door that we hope is well locked and um, not used during the time the kids are in that area. Next, please. And here's another lovely one. And this one has all of the play equipment all arranged with plenty of space for a group of children to be able to work with that equipment, as well as you can see a room beyond it which um, may be for their quiet space. But this one has enough activity stuff. Everything is reachable. Um, color scheme is great. Outdoor lighting again. And colors, the, uh, the other thing to look for is the colors of the walls. In this case, you've got a very nice calming shade of blue. Lots of bright colors um, create more excitement in young children and so if you have a lot of bright colored kid stuff around the best thing to do is have neutral or calming colors like blue on the walls and, and that helps to keep your program operating well next slide another indoor environment this one is really very well divided again showing areas for play, areas with a table, everything at um, everything at child level. Um, looks like little soft um, cushiony things in the section to the left. And the rocking chair in the other room and tables so that children can be in both of these areas simultaneously. Some children using the trucks and things in in the area on the left, some children using activity things in the other room, and the provider is able to see them and have visual contact with everybody in the space at the same time. She can then bring children together in an area to do group activities, but in this point, it just shows that they can be in both places, be safe, and be making choices about the activities that they're doing. Next, please. Outdoors. Here's an interesting outdoor activity space. You can tell from the um, ground cover that the fall zone is very good between uh, beneath the swings and on all of the climbing areas. There's a little playhouse out back and um, a grassy area. It looks like things that are not for children's use are fenced off at the back, so that's good. There is a driveway area at the right, and I'm assuming from the way the picture is that that is blocked off and it's for kids on using riding equipment on that area. You wouldn't want the driveway to be open or cars to be able to come in. So the way that is fenced off, I'm assuming that that driveway has also been blocked off. And this again gives children a lot of opportunities at different kinds of things to do in that area. There's quite a lot of things in this area, could probably do with maybe a few less pieces, 
but it does show that there are plenty of opportunities for various kinds of physical activity for the children in this particular space. Next, please. By contrast, this is one of those wide open grassy areas where kids can just do just about anything, run, play. Um, it's amazing how many things kids can find to do when there's not a whole lot of stuff to climb on. So there are opportunities to do this. Again, many right ways to do things. This is an area that is for open play. It looks like there's a paved area that would be used, again, for um, riding vehicles. And play toys can be brought into the area or kids can just play there. Um, the one thing that is missing in this particular space, except perhaps for the shade at the right-hand side, is a place for kids to be able to um, sit quietly in a shaded space if it's very hot or um, just to be able to relax and perhaps even just sit and enjoy the scenery or even look at a book. Um, you want to have all of those opportunities for kids, but in this space, there's a lot of freedom and a lot of openness and um, looks like a good way to be creative. And I just got to check my time, so I'm not falling back. Okay, um, next slide, please. One of the things that we focus on in childcare homes is to be sure that the lighting is not so bright that babies lying on the floor are looking up at some kind of a really, really bright light. In this case, you've got a diffused light fixture, which could even have a dimmer on it. And you can see that the babies would be sleeping in the uh, porta crib that's on the left. And it looks like there's some good soft padding on the floor. So I'm imagining that this is also a crawl space for babies. So this lighting, if a baby was laying on its back on the floor looking up, this lighting would be quite comfortable. And the again, and we've got windows with outdoor lighting. Um, in our state, there used to be a requirement that there had to be outdoor lighting available in all classrooms, in child care centers, and in family child care providers' homes. Um, that is not the case, but when it can be available, it's really nice to have around. Um, the only thing in this space that I would question is that there are some small items on those shelves that I don't know would be appropriate for the infants if they were crawling around. Um, so I would be, if I were going in there to do an um, observation, I would probably be checking on that, but I can't really tell specifically if those are tiny items. So. Let's hope that it's, that's not the case. Thanks. Next picture. Arrangements. Um, wow, there are all kinds of ways to arrange things in your family child care home and to make them both accessible and in some cases inaccessible, depending on what activities you're looking at. At this case, we have what are looking like some paint supplies and some other program materials that are all in a very, very nicely organized cabinet. I will assume that the things on the lower shelves can be accessed by the children, and that's good, and that those large jugs of paints or colors are ones that are used by the provider. And in this situation, everything seems very well organized, and in what seems like it might be a secured space. Let's try the next one. And here's a really cool arrangement of uh, kids' coats in cubbies. Cubbies are something that you can buy, and you can also just have some creative friend of yours build them. And it's a great way, first of all, to store kids' clothes, but it's also an educational opportunity, learning which is your space, where your things go and being able as children age to be able to actually go back and find their little cubby and hang their own coats. Um, I can remember when I was in kindergarten, the greatest thing with these little things, you didn't have your name on them because at that point that wasn't working. It was like you were the, were the teddy bear or the kitten or something. And mine was a teddy bear cubby and learned very quickly where my things went and my 
parents knew where to find my things to pick them up. So um, doing something like this, if you can, in a family child care home is very effective. You can also see that this is an area outside of where the children are going to be doing activities and also outside of the kitchen area. So it's not like children are going to be interacting with these cupboards during the day. Um, also some delightful artwork on the walls. Next, please. And here is another room arrangement, this one for two infants with, again, play shelves with items on them for them. I would probably not be using that top shelf unless they were toddlers, but it is a nice room with lighting. The porta cribs are well separated from each other. And it looks like a very calming and quiet place for little ones. Next, please. That's the completion of my set of slides. I hope you've enjoyed learning at least a little bit about the kinds of things that we look for when we do family child care accreditation. And that if you have not already entered the accreditation process, that you will consider doing that working with the National Association for Family Child Care. It's a great way to improve the quality of your program and to be able to achieve all of the things that you learned about in the first part of this session. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please share with Barbara Ann. That's, that was such an incredible uh, presentation. We've learned so much. <laughs> um, and, and the things that you've, you've mentioned in terms of the, of the, the specifics of each one of those and those pictures, um, I, I, they're so super helpful. And I think it really does tie in um, with how space and all of these other components or variables that we've been talking about really can come together in very, very nicely in, in environments, uh, family child care environments. So thank you so much. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Barbara Ann and Rocio. Um, if you, if anybody watching this has questions, you can send them to you. You can type them into the question panel on the side and um, we can read them off and have Barbara Ann or Rocio, whoever you would like to ask a question to answer them. So we can wait around for a second, Barbara Ann and Rocio, if you guys are okay with that and see if anything comes through. Absolutely. Great. Okay, looks like we have one question or a few coming in. Um, we have a qu question from Monet Barton, but Monet, it looks like it didn't send it all. So maybe um, try sending that question again. Um, Nancy Murray says, I like how you showed us other options for our environments and I can make the necessary changes. Lots of great ideas. Thank you. And then Karen Morgan is asking, um, so this might be for Rocio, is there an email for Sesame Street? Yes, there is actually. And let me let me move this slide so that you have it. Um, it's community at sesame.org. Um, and you can email us anytime. We we would love to to hear your your thoughts, not only about this webinar, but any of our materials. And and we really like to build community. So um, if you go into Sesame Street in communities um, on a Facebook page and like us, you can be part of, of the conversations that we have there as well. Awesome. Thank you, Rocio. Um, this one looks like it will probably be for Barbara Ann. Um, and Monet is asking, the diaper area didn't appear to have running water. Why? Actually, that's a very good observation. Thank you, because I didn't even notice that. And that is really a complication in family child care and the diapering table should be near an area where there's running water, but it has to be in a bathroom kind of running water area. And it really makes it difficult. It's difficult because if you put that diapering table right in the bathroom, then you really don't have visibility of the children unless that bathroom is somehow open to the room. So diapering is probably one of the big challenges for family and child care. And I totally agree with the 
the observation. Thank you. Um, Lori just commented that she loves and along with one of the pictures that you showed us, Barbara Ann. Um, so there's that. And Barbara Skiff is saying, thank you for showing the slides. Barbara Ann, I'm accredited since 2008 and have an observation visit next month. Thanks for showing the slides. It's always nice to see other setups to give us new ideas. And she enjoyed this very much. So I agree. Thank you guys for presenting this. And congratulations on getting to that observation visit. Okay, so it looks like we're slowing down on questions. Some of you are asking if it's possible to get a copy of the slides. Um, the copy of the slides will be sent out to everyone that attended, so you will be getting a copy of that. Um, we're getting a few more questions, so we'll finish up with these. Uh, Rita is asking, is it okay to have a room that is multi-purpose? I live in NYC, so my infant room is multi-purpose. When I'm being observed, will they expect to see how it is used? Actually, everything becomes multi-purposed in a family and child care home. You just have to be sure that there are spaces that are allowing each of the age groups to be able to do what they need to do. But um, I've seen, I've observed in plenty of family and child care homes where those, all of the age groups are accommodated within a room. You just have to figure out how to make it work. Uh, so I hope that yours will work for your observation. Um, if you, uh, you know, the other thing I want to suggest to everybody before we leave is take, after you get it set up the way you think it's supposed to be, take a picture because I have found in anything that I've designed and I've designed child care centers as well as family and child care environments, even when I think it's perfect, I then take pictures. And when you see it and still, you know, when you're not in the space, you're just looking at the picture, it really makes a big difference. Awesome. Rita says thank you. So thank you, Barbara Ann, for that. Um, the next question is from Jamila, and she says, would there be an alternative way of getting the natural light needed if the child care area and space is in a basement with one window? Um, actually, then you would work with the lighting that you use in that space so that perhaps if you could use a dimmer switch on the lighting in the space so that you'd be able to lower it at some times and not have um you know have to have bright light all the time that would be my recommendation for that space okay and looks like that's the end of most of our questions um so if there's any if there's anything else that barbara ann or rosier you guys want to add in um, other than that, we'll, I guess we'll just finish the webinar. Everyone can look for the certificate of attendance being emailed tomorrow. And that's all I have. So Barbara Ann, Rocio, is there anything else you guys would like to add? Just thanks for the opportunity. Oh, it's been yes, and thank you. Thank you for having us, uh, Nicole and Barbara Ann. Thank you so much for, for being part of this webinar. We Again, we've learned so much from you. Um, and we hope that everybody that is getting their observations, everything goes well. Um, and it will be great to, to hear from you and how it went. Uh, so email us. Thank you. Okay, thanks guys. And everyone have a great night. Thank you. Good night.